Um, good morning, almost good afternoon to everyone. So thank you very much for inviting me to share um, a little bit about this really interesting, quite exciting project that um, Welcome uh, did, it, as we've been talking about it, on the contract side of um, how they've been commissioning research. So I'm Mina Fazal. I'm a, a professor of adolescent psychiatry at the University of Oxford. I'm also a practicing child and adolescent psychiatrist, which is why today is a complicated day for me because it's actually my clinical day. So I've seen patients this morning and I'll leave shortly after lunch to see the rest of my patients later today. So apologies for that. And for those of you who have care responsibilities, I've left child three of five sick in bed alone at home <laughs> so so many of us are juggling complicated um um uh, struggles while we uh, want to do this research but anyway i'm what i call a very applied researcher so my background was in social anthropology and medicine i'm very interested in um how we can improve access to services and part of that is obviously to think about the, the massive opportunity that big data is bringing us and how we can channel that to better understand um, what that means moving forward. For many of these cohorts that we're thinking of developing, we are, I run a big study called the Oxford Study in Oxford as well, where we're doing that. If my slides could come up, I'll go through them, but if they don't come up, I'll just talk you through them anyway. I have to put them up. Oh, good Lord, that's far too much. There we go. So um, the mind kind study um, was really, a really interesting, really challenging and interesting opportunity to say that how in the world can we work out what young people actually want in this process of big data? Um, and I'm, I'm a very small part of a very big team that worked on it. So it was um, mainly um, research on the West Coast of America. I'm leading this, but we were three main country sites, the UK, India, and South Africa. Um, it was also a study that had a very big component of adolescent um, co-production in it. And what we really wanted to learn was about data governance models and whether that affected the engagement of young people in providing data through, for example, a mental health app. So that was the core question at heart. So through, I suppose, incredibly generous funding, we were able to um, really invest in the youth voice in a way that we've never done before. So I'm particularly interested in this. And I think all my co-collaborators tolerated my insistence on going just like even further with this. So what we had was what we called a professional youth advisor on each study site. And that professional youth advisor, who was someone with lived experience, who was within the age range of youth, um, and ours in the UK, for example, was a 22 year old, um, they would run the young people's advisory groups. They would actually recruit them. They would ensure diversity and they would actually properly represent that voice into the main study. Um, firstly, by working with our young people's advisory groups for you know a year, it became a year and a half to truly, you know, so like I'm putting grant applications together now and this comes to the core of the problem, isn't it? Right now I need funding for young people's advisory groups, but we have none when we're putting the grant application together. So obviously our young people were very upset they hadn't been involved earlier in the study, um, but actually I thought it was unbelievable engagement we had going forward and I think it changed what we understood by the level of youth engagement that we can do in these studies, but it requires considerable investment. And we're very grateful we had that investment. So number one, we learned how to embed the youth voice in this study so that we could understand youth preferences as a result of the study as well. So um, there's a, a, a very long report that has been written that is accessible to everybody. So excuse me for skimming over this, but I'll just tell you what I think are the interesting takeaways. So we were really interested to learn about choice of data governance models. And will it facilitate us getting more information for young people if they understand um, what we're going to do with that data and who we're going to allow to access that data. So there are two components to the data, isn't it? Where is the repository? And then who's allowed to look at it and at what cost maybe? So how should researchers be allowed to access the data? Are they allowed to download it, put it on their computers, do whatever they want with pre-registration or not? Um, 
do they have to access it through a server so everything they do is measured and monitored and you know you're accountable in a way or do researchers use a recreated data set that kind of work out their analysis and then ask some kind of bona fide researcher embedded in the research to conduct that research for you not a great model for early career researchers sorry because you won't ever be able to do much yourselves and then the next question is who should control the data once it's, you know, once it's been collected? Should participants vote on it when they give their data? I'm going to give you this data of mine, but this is how I think you should use it. And then the, the kind of majority voice prevails there. Should we have a community review panel? So young people who given their data or representatives of that young person deciding or should it be the professional review panel a process that we as researchers uh, understand very well so um it had two parts of this study so one was uh, developing a, an app a mental health app that was very interesting based on the active ingredients that actually wasn't the point of the study but i think we've got you know we welcome people to look at that data because it is incredibly interesting um, so in order to access that app you had to consent to the study and as part of that consent you were offered a data governance model and over 1000 participants were recruited from each study site so you've got this uk india south africa models and there were these four arms to the study i'm not going to talked about these because I know at these moments I usually glaze over but anyway stick with me so you had participant choice so participants could choose how they those issues or participants were allocated one of those choices without knowing that there were other maze and we wanted to see did it that change engagement so that's the study design I won't talk you through it what are the findings so we asked the young people who were in the arm where they had choice, how should researchers access the data? And basically the blue represents the secure server and the three different blocks are the different countries. So basically across the three countries, a secure server um, was the preferred model. Um, and the data steward was the least preferred model. Um, so I think that's just really, helpful really useful moving forward uh downloading is also an option um but i think we've you know and they're incredibly good examples of secure servers so actually that is a model that we us in the uk developing data can think about using we then ask kind of who should control access um so those were in the kind of pinky is the democracy in the green is the professional review panel and the blue is the volunteer community review panel. So it seems that across the three sites, the volunteer uh, community review panel is not the preferred option. Uh, and um, really professional review panel and the democratic way of deciding how your, your data is used as you kind of input it were the most um, uh, preferred models. Again, I think incredibly useful for us moving forward. We don't need to keep asking these questions now. We can actually just take some of this learning ahead. There are changing preferences by age. So uh, in the UK, um, which is the blue line, as you get older, you're less likely to like the professional review panel <laughs> disastrously. Um, but, you know, and, and actually, isn't that the case? The more we know about this, the more we learn, the more concerned we are and the less likely we are to give it. Um, I haven't seen her put the five minute line. I said, anyway, no, I, won't, I, I want to tell you about my experience last night, which I was chatting to someone. And then this morning, you know, I get an email from some company telling me, why don't you buy X, which is a thing I was discussing last night. So we're getting more and more kind of tested by data and how it's being managed. Now, the really interesting thing about this study was we then had the arm where you were just allocated um, which data governance model would be applied to your data. And then we looked at enrollment in the study and engagement in the study. And basically, despite preferences, basically it made no difference to the amount of data that ended up being collected. So if you had your choice versus if you were allocated the least uh, preferred model, in the app where we collected mental health data, it made no difference to the amount of data that was collected. And so, again, I think that is really interesting, really useful. These are big numbers, I think, you know, for us feeble mental health researchers who are happy with 10. You know, this is, you know, 1,500 in the UK. You know, and I, I think that for us was a big surprise and I think um, something we need to reflect on and learn about. 
So, for example, we then ask further questions about profit and payment. So can your data be used by researchers to make a profit? And actually, the UK in particular, but most of them do not want their data to be used for profit. So these young people are incredibly altruistic. They want their data to be used and they want it to be used for the public good. Um, they're really suspicious if we then take it and try and sell it. Quite right, too, actually. Um, and do people have to pay to use their data? Well, there's more of a preference towards not having to pay. But if payment, you know, re requests were more around commercial companies paying, so those that they think would want to make a profit. So quite clear messages. Then how for their data be used? I'm sorry, it's not great, so I'm just going to move over to the next slide where it's in the table. I was trying to make it easier for you to see, but actually, let's just go back to the table. So, um, so this is data that has been collected. Actually, the preference is that data gets used for research um, and all types of health research. And you know, so basically, they want their research, their data used. Uh, uh, about half will want it for whatever we do, really. There was also um, a, a big qualitative study. So like I said, the youth engagement component of the study was remarkable because of the massive investment. And through that, we were able to meet with kind of many groups of young people in, in each of the study sites and across study sites to understand their preferences. Um, so there's rich data here that I'm not going to talk to you about in detail, but I invite you to come and look at. But basically, what comes out of it were drivers of engagement, which is around data sharing, the preference young people want their data used. They realise that we need to understand more about this science. And actually, they want to be part of that. So there are lots of kind of important nuances around the benefits of sharing, around the importance of normalising, of protecting and understanding mental health, as well as the risk of data sharing. So kind of fully aware of the leaky data, lost data, disbelief and anonymity, uh, et cetera. So uh, apologies for not giving you time to read the quotes, but I'm going to move on. And then... Finally, I suppose, what makes engagement complicated or messy? So it's about controlling the access. And like, basically, you know, you know what types of access. Very aware that, you know, even if it's hosted in one place, to make it accessible to many places um, and the importance of that. And that actually they're very aware of these kind of nefarious uses of data as well. You know, if even if we're researchers, so trust being at the core of everything we do and trusted institutions. So those of us aligned with, I think, big academic institutions are in a relatively good position. I think as young people are saying they trust these. This is the type of institution they want to hold their data. Um, so other learnings quickly, I'll share with you because this is a bit of fun. How in the world do we in the UK get? young people who are Android users to come into the study because basically all our young people, it seems, have moved over to Apple. So um, we learned a lot about how to recruit through social media. And so this is a graph just to show that there are thousands of posters, two million emails, talks in schools and universities made absolutely no difference. It was basically targeted ads through Instagram, um, for example, on New Year's Eve saying New Year's resolution, why don't you look at this app and help data so at the same time? Uh, the very last day, which is like your last 24 hours to participate, suddenly massive recruit. So we're more than happy also to share our very painful learning about how best to recruit young people, but actually paid through Instagram was, I think, the most cost effective way and time effective way to do it. And that's just a, um, a slide to show you that. So that's just saying so social media was the way we got basically everyone into this study from the UK. So in conclusion, youth have nuanced and thoughtful preferences about how their data is managed and used, but they actually want us to use it. Um, it's, I think that's pretty against what GDPR is doing in the UK right now. So, you know, if we're saying we want to listen to young people's voices, I don't think policy and the way that's moving is actually reflective of what young people are saying. Um, we expected the governance model to impact on acceptability, but we didn't see that. Um, and then just finally on the actual app, there was also kind of really interesting. The young people could choose which active ingredients um, to use in their app and which not. And that also didn't um, result in less engagement if they didn't get to choose. So um, thank you for coming. And, and really, I'm just happy to share really some of the really rich findings that came. So thank you for coming. That's it.
Um, I think this is on. Yes, a uh, question over there. Have you looked at um, technologies like Tim Berners-Lee's Solid Pods personal online data source for managing consent? I uh, know, no, because no. this was part of a consenting process to get into an app. So I think long term, I'd love to learn more about it, but not in this study. Question down here. Thank you. That's really, really interesting. Um, I was quite surprised that your um, information governance sort of uh, type wasn't associated with uptake of the app. Um, I just wondered whether you'd looked at any particular subgroups, particularly those who might be traditionally less inclined to be involved with, in research to see yeah. if there are any important differences there. So um, we've got some country differences that enable that. So the UK, because of our uh, consenting processes, we were able to recruit younger populations. So we have 16 and 17 year olds. Um, and we also had 91% saying that they had lived experience of mental health problems. So we were recruiting a group that we were very interested in. But from the initial analyses, nothing clear seems to be emerging. Now, um, SAGE, who ran this, have, are making all the data available. So I think those types of analyses are going to be really interesting. And I think that the, the open science requesters please if you're interested in it to come and look at it because it is a shame to lose that kind of granularity that we don't have right now just age Liz. hi um thank you very much for your talk and your enthusiasm about the project is really infectious so i'd love to read it when it's written up um, it's written up it's very long but the papers <laughs> will come out soon um just wondered if you could speculate, I mean, young people have a particular um, relationship with technology that we as an older generation don't have. Do you think these views would hold in older uh, populations? Yeah, you know, it, interestingly, I was sitting on the train today with one of my uh, postdocs, we have to be travelling together, and we were talking about it, and we were like, yeah, you know, basically, we have these strong opinions, but at the end of the day, I just want to use the app anyway, so I don't care. So there is something about, I think, we've got all this, we kind of know that's probably not right or whatever, you know, but actually if we want to access something, we then do it. So my hunch is, I, I think we're just getting, although it's so important, and I'm just telling you how irritated I am that I got an email related to a conversation I had last night, but I'll still have those conversations. I'm not going to turn off these, you know, like I think we, so I'm not sure. Important question. And I think when we're thinking long-term about these longitudinal cohorts of what you know basically we're hoping this is all going to feed into our understanding about how to do this or how better to understand you know data science the thing is about how do we you know if our opinions are going to change over time how do we build that into these types of models so it's a really important question but i've i'm quite confused about how that will happen question over there yeah um I can also add to that answer. I in can't the, see you. I can't oh, see you. Oh, there. Sorry. <laughs> um, in um, in our research with adults, with mainly people with mental illness, the results were very similar um, in terms of people want their data to be used for good, not for profit, and they are fairly positive about sharing data. And I also appreciated that slide about recruitment because. Oh, last at the start of the summer, I spent so long emailing loads and loads of people and um, eventually got maybe 150 responses. And then we paid someone to put it on Facebook and we've got a thousand responses. And it is it is so labor intensive to recruit. So I think it's worth pointing out that if you want to do work like this, you need to cost in the uh, the amount that you will need to pay to recruit, like like you pointed out. Yeah, although actually I, I don't think it was that expensive compared to all the expense we put in time of all these other no. things that brought very little. Yeah. So it's us just getting with the times, isn't it? And whether we want to work with TikTok influencers, because that's a big kind of curiosity about mine. You know, my daughter's like, you know, why not? Although, you know, she did say once the recruitment had ended for us, I said, yeah, I kept seeing that advert online. Like, what? <laughs> she hadn't even let me know all along. So I do think it's interesting, isn't it? These these new ways. Yeah, it's a quick one. Can I ask you whether you kind of focus when engaging with people, whether you focus on specific types of studies 
was it or kind of studies in general so i'm just wondering whether the opinion would change whether it's clinical trial or whether oh, it's longitudinal yeah, studies or yeah. so qualitative or i think our, our thinking was around longitudinal studies and okay. data collection in that context okay. um and then the different models that were offered came out of extensive work with young people about what different models there were as well so like doing a lot of kind of education around x and y and then what do you th so it was a quite a long process around that as well thanks andrew so the, the two, one really quick question, which probably has a yes or no, and then a follow up, if that's okay. I've never given a yes or no in my life. Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you ask? Uh, just did you ask about sample sharing? Whether people had different attitudes to sample sharing versus data sharing? Uh, no. No. Great. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Good. Uh, my follow up question is about um, working with pharmaceutical industry. Uh, that most people, uh, you know, most people want better drugs, no. don't they? And. Um, <laughs> Uh, but they, but they, they're distrustful of 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 data so are being used. Are these not to... for profit pharmaceutical companies? Sorry, are the pharmaceutical companies not for profit? I think, you know, because the young people are very, very clear. When you enter the for profit, yeah. they don't, you know, they don't actually think that is equitable access to data across the world for people. So, what would be? What do you think? Sorry, uh, what do you think would be acceptable? How do we kind of make that jump from, you know, sharing, n not feeling comfortable about sharing data with pharmaceutical industry, or at least yeah. feeling less comfortable about it, yeah. but, but the need for pharmaceutical companies to have access to, to better data and yeah. to make a profit? How, how do you, what's your own, what are your own thoughts about how you, you kind of square that? Oh, I see. So I suppose what you said was the need for pharmaceutical companies to have access to data. Fully agree. Like, I think young people are saying, we want to be actively a part of it, but you said, I'd have to make a profit. And that's where I'm like, I don't know if I'd, I agree with that model, actually. So, so I, you know, I, I wonder whether there can be far more creative ways to understand engagement with industry that isn't on a for-profit model. Because look at, Look at all of us. Like I'm crying because I had to pay 28 quid for my parking. It's part of, you know, like you know, <laughs> that comes out of my. Do you know what I mean? So you know, we're all. I don't know why. I don't know why we should accept that, and that's why we're losing engagement with this group, really, because there's a lack of. It, it's not just the for-profit model. There's a lack of trust in that as well. So how are they actually going to use my data? Is it actually going to be? And actually, is it actually, are you going to find something that then actually not everyone is going to be able to access after? You know, as you know, as I said before, I think this is an age group that is incredibly altruistic and is very, very keen actually to go the extra mile, to give an extra two hours of their time if it means for everyone's benefit. And I think it would be a real shame to say, oh, well, that's just not going to work with, with the pharmaceutical industry. No, maybe the pharmaceutical industry just needs to think a little bit more creatively about some assumptions. Great, thanks very much. Definitely Mina Fazel's opinion, and no, not my. <laughs> I please don't like you know whatever. Yeah, more than have to talk about it. <laughs> no, it's all on video now. It's all of our opinions. So. <laughs> Great, no, thanks very much, Mina. That's been excellent. Thanks.